Hey, fun fans. We're getting close to reaching 1 million views on YouTube, and to help us celebrate 254, the Cheesy Poos has provided us an awesome t-shirt to give away. All you have to do to be entered is to be a YouTube subscriber and let us know in the comments which team you're from. You can enter once in every YouTube video uploaded through the month of September, so make sure you comment below. Starting off, um, I, we have a really broad question, but it's hopefully one you can kind of summarize. Um, what is the kind of first step you go about when you approach designing an FTC game? Good question. Um, so it starts with, um, there, there's kind of three different entities involved. So there's the game design committee first and then Andy Mark. Um, and so the three of us, you know, really work together and the game design committee, um, they had their, um, they, they were in the, the credits for the game animation. Um, they're a group of volunteers that put in a phenomenal amount of work to sort of roadmap out, you know, you know what the game, you know, should be and sort of the the crayon sketch of, of what the game should be. And then, you know, we're on weekly uh, phone calls back and forth, um, you know, and, and so I kind of come in to say, hey, well, we could manufacture it like this or we could manufacture it like that. And, and you know, they're sort of there going, well, okay, and this could be worth this many points and this could be worth that many points. And you know, if, if this costs this much, and so that's, that's sort of my part, if this costs this much, then we can only have this many of them on the field, which means we need to make it higher point value or lower point value. You know, so it's a, it's a really good um, back and forth that we have, you know, across the whole team, um, you know, various people, you know, that are, that are going back and forth on this. That's yeah, super but, cool. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, it's very interesting to see how that process sort of works in the first place. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really nice to have your insight. So another question that was there was that in general, there's always the there's the one inch tolerance um, on the physical field. They always say uh, do, do uh, build for one inch. And so in terms of the skybridge structure, how accurate are they? Are they looking? Will 14 and 20 be approximately 14 and 20? Or is that one inch tolerance really going to be tested? I think the, the one inch tolerance comes in a lot on how the field is set up. Um, and we did a lot of stuff this year to make sure that that could go as smoothly and consistently as possible. So the the bookends at, at, at either end of the sky bridge, the reason those go all the way down to the floor is because we know that is a universal reference. We, we will always have a floor. <laughs> um, instead yep. of locking those on to like the, the field perimeter rail with given how, you know, they can kind of move and wiggle and bend and flex and some are different heights than others and whatever else, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's going to introduce some, some variables. And so by going all the way down to the floor, we knew we were going to get consistent heights. Um, so all of the individual components are sort of made to sort of modern CNC machine tolerances. Everything is, you know, plus minus five, ten thousandths of an inch, um, and so I would say that uh, barring anything sort of odd, um, most fields should be um, – most field structures should be well within uh, that, that one-inch tolerance. Um, but, you know, things can kind of go, you know, sort of funny. So um, – you know, we, we have some some checks and some alignment jigs and some various things. So all of the Skybridge supports, I think, or towers or the big funny Y-shaped thing, <laughs> um, you know, we assembled those uh, at Andy Mark because we knew we wanted to make sure that we could add a layer of quality control to that. Um, and, and we could put the rivets in with, you know, big, powerful, you know, air tools and, and save people, you know, the, the headache and stress of putting those in by hand. Um, but one of the things that also let us do is that also let us check to make sure that all of those holes got, you know, drilled um, on our CNC milling machine uh, in the right spot. And so all of those things should be, you know, really, really close to, you know, their, their mm -hmm. final, you know, dimensions. Um, so all of those prints um, are, are up on the web page um, in our prints repository. If you got to think maybe something's not right, you know, you can take a look at it. Um, everything should be. Um, you know, right, right in the the, the sweet zone there, with, mm -hmm. with some relatively small tolerances. That's awesome. And uh, this next question is something I I'm really interested in is uh, from gymnast five four four and Adam fourteen eight seven five is how is the tightness of the stones interlocking decided? And how are the tolerance on those bricks? Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> see, that's 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 the answer. <laughs> My man. <laughs> they, they're not Legos. They they do not click together. Um, they they do have a bit of wobble to them. Um, 
and the the tolerance on these like the whole overall size is is really nice and tight so um like a lot of the videos showed, we know that they all stack next to each other. You can put a couple of them on and put uh, more stones in between them. So they, they do cross over from one to the next. Um, they're, they're nice and repeatable like that, um, but they do not hold themselves together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. See, your, your demonstration was perfect. It's, that's, 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 <laughs> that's, that's, that's the quality, bro. That's, that's awesome. Um, so um, Jim, uh, so uh, um, gymnast five, four, four asks, um, why was it chosen to not have a hang on the bars on the field? Not entirely sure what that question is asking. Oh, why can't you hang on the bars? All right. The, that was something that the, the game design committee kind of toyed around with back and forth. Um, one of the things that, that that would have required is that would have put a lot more stresses and a lot more into the 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 sky bridge assembly itself um but it definitely was something that that kind of got tossed around and, and it was something that ultimately we you know the the game design committee and, and andy mark and the costing and the manufacturing and all those different forces kind of came together and said you know we don't really need this we we can do a fun end game you know in in different ways we can do different things you know kind of at at, at different points um and and so it, it kind of turned into this thing that you know we could do as a limbo bar, um, and that helped us with some of the the setup time and and some of those other different you know factors that that we weigh in there. For sure, um, yeah. kind of steamrolling along. Um, Vin Gerb something Vin Gerbert, um, uh, Josie Bell, a lot of people, uh, Elon, and I let my be it asked, um, was the stone based off a Lego piece? I. It doesn't share any dimensions and it doesn't really share, you know, anything <laughs> with a Lego brick. We have square studs, Legos are round. Um, but Lego uh, was, you know, the, the people from first and first Lego league talked to the people over at Lego. Um, and they thought, you know, that it, it was kind of nifty. They, they were excited for the, the, the crossover. And, and so um, they didn't have any problems with it. That's, that's definitely for sure. And they, they thought it was a nifty kind of, you know, crossover and tie in. So, a good follow-up. Uh, um, uh, what inspired the size of those stones? And the color, too. <laughs> uh, it's pretty close to the old-school FTC gold, um, which just, like, okay. in real life, looks really good. Um, something between that and the gray just, like, looks awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And the size, it looked right. Uh, both, like, <laughs> sitting in the CAD model, looking on the field, um it it looked right given how big it is compared to an ftc robot it, it just kind of sort of felt right mm -hmm. all right uh gymnast 544 asks what do you think is the best way to stack the stones i mean <laughs> i think he means uh straight vertically or as we talked about before in a lattice pattern so i think to me the one of the big things is the height of your capstone is mm -hmm. one of the only like differentiators between you know one of the only like kind of like guaranteed differentiators between you and the other alliance right both alliances have the mm -hmm. same opportunity to you know kind of score the same points in the end game you know they're, they're just check boxes right did you park here check yes or no right, right. um you have the same sort of opportunity in with autonomous stuff so the number of bricks and the height of your mm -hmm. capstone are the two really big differentiators. So um, I would say the best methodology of stacking is the one you're most comfortable in and the one you feel safest with. Okay. All right. So another question from Alphabiscuit495. And uh, what do you think will be a good output for the stones, a claw or something else? I don't know. I... I I it seems like they're just trying to get you to design their robots for you now, Danny. <laughs> well, I mean, if you want to call Andy Mark during normal business hours, we can definitely you know, help you out with some product suggestions. <laughs> um, but I can't give away all my secrets here, you know, in front of everybody. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So um, we got another question from uh, Jose Bobelli. Um, how, do you, how do the vision targets get chosen? <laughs> um, that is a process between uh, First HQ, the Game Design Committee. Um, this year, obviously, as you can see in the images themselves, Disney and Lucasfilm uh, were involved in that. 
Um, and so that is something I don't have any insight or awareness of. Those get told to me and I put them in the CAD model. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Uh, another question from Gymnast544. Um, what do you think the top score is going to be at Worlds? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to see a lot of volatility because I think people are going to try to build risky and they're going to build super tall and they're going to fall over. So I think you're going to see uh, yeah. a really wide spattering of scores at Worlds. I think that's Another... somewhere where the uh, TBP, like the new ranking point uh, scoring method could come into play. You know, like if you're playing against an alliance and they have a super high score, but, you know, at, at the last second, it just falls over. Uh, it's not that impactful for you because you do have that one match, you know, leeway that can get cut off of your uh, calculations. That's a very interesting point. That is. Mm -hmm. um, so another question is, um, again, may, might be out of the scope of uh, what your, um, your expertise is. But um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, why was the human player added to FTC? Does it have anything to do with first global, or and how did or how did the game designers decide upon the human player? Um, it was something that, if memory serves, it was something that was kind of involved from more or less the beginning. Um, you know, again, we knew that we wanted um, kind of a, a bigger uh, game piece and finding real estate on the field to put all of those uh, was really tricky um, and really congested the field. So by moving those off the field and having the human players introduce them, you know, one at a time really saved that real estate. So we got to have sort of a lot of game pieces, big game pieces and an open field all at once. So just it, it checked a lot of boxes by going about it that direction. Mm -hmm. Redfish Robotics uh, 9958 asks, uh, how interactive is the game design process between Andy Mark and the game design committee? Um, like, does the game design committee ever suggest something that Andy Mark decides is too hard or too expensive? Oh, I like absolutely. Um, it is. It is a very collaborative sort of three-way environment, you know, between the the game design committee, Andy Mark, and and first. So, um, you know. We suggest you know things to them. You know, say, hey, what if we bought? It? What if we did it like this? And they say, well, hey, what if you created something like this? So there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of you know, I mean, it's a process that takes kind of like a year um, to to go from sort of some of those first initial sketches to kickoff day, where we're we're introducing you know the the field to the world. And obviously, some of that is time that we need to manufacture all of these kits and all of these different components. Um, some of it is time, you know, testing, but we, we do a lot of testing along the way. We, you know, we, we get an idea, we get a prototype and we, and we test something off uh, along the way. So it is, it is very, very collaborative. It is very dynamic. You know, the, everybody, you know, works really, really well together. We've been doing this. This is our sixth game. So we kind of know everybody's, you know, sort of take on things. Um, and we, we have a lot of open communication. So we share a lot of documents, we share a lot of information, um, and, and we really have a good uh, back and forth. All right. Uh, Adam from 14875 asks, how do you think the 14-inch height limit impacts the game? Oh, I think it's super cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my quick follow-up question, do you think there will be teams who will stay above that 14 inches, or do you think most people will try to design below? I think you're going to see a lot of you know differences. I think you know you, you might see you're obviously going to see robots that are going to be low and just travel bricks back and forth. But then I think you're also going to see robots that are maybe sort of in that in betweener group um, that are going to say you know we're going to be a specialist stacking robot and we're going to let our partner you know grab us some bricks. Um, and so they may you know say hey like in order to get that mechanism to be a really good stacker we got to go above that, you know, 18 inch number and, mm -hmm. uh, or we got to be at that 18 inch number and going below 14 is going to be really tricky. So, um, I don't think you're going to see, uh, you might see it skew one way or the other. I don't think it's going to be exclusively, you know, less than 14 robots. All right. Uh, Xander Freemaker asks now, Danny, couldn't one make his team a stone, a three printed stone with their logo and uh, gymnast five, four, four also asks, what do you think is the best capstone design? Well, what's the best capstone design? Hmm, that's tricky. Um, it depends. I mean, we saw one of the robot in 30 hours that had a separate little arm and a very unique uh, capstone that had a, an old 
velocity vortex ball and a two inch uh, FTC cube kind of plopped on top yeah. of it. Um, mm-hmm. But then you're also, we've seen, you know, some on stuff on Reddit and, and various places where people sort of 3D printed the the underside of the cube on, mm-hmm. on like all faces so that they could still sort of use this, the, their same claw or their same gripper um, mm-hmm. to place that, that capstone, you know, up on top of the stack. Yeah. So I would say that you should think of your capstone as part of your robot system and try mm-hmm. to optimize your robot system to play the game mm-hmm. the best way possible. Not necessarily just look at this versus that versus, you know, the other thing there, there will be no universally best widget. Otherwise we would all do that and exclusively that. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. So uh, VN Gilbert asks, presumably the most important question of the night um <laughs> do the sky stones float because he thinks that it'll be useful for the in event inevitable water game so they have a small hole on them where's my camera <laughs> feed right there so All long right. as you plug that hole or or cap that oh here we got the close-up again shoot nope Dang. bingo Yep. So as long as you throw a piece of duct tape or something over that hole, it's a it's an open air volume on the inside. This thing will float for days. Um, it'll be great. Hey. So um, how uh, how are the stones made? Great question. Um, they are uh, blow molded, um, and so they can be a, a hollow inside volume. Um, I'm sure there's, there's lots of videos about blow molding um, up on YouTube, but basically what it is is there's a, a big steel die um, and then a, a plastic extruder. They extrude down a tube of plastic and they can vary the wall thickness. Um, and so then they, they extrude this tube. The two halves come together and pinch it. And then, um, yeah, oh, great video. The, the two halves come together. They pinch it. They seal it at the top and bottom. It cuts open. They inject air. It forces the plastic out to the full... Um, exterior of uh, the mold, and then you have a shape that is really well controlled over the outside of um, your volume. Uh, we don't really care about the inside, especially in you know something like this. Um, and then you get uh, your finished uh, thing. So it allows you to use a little bit of plastic to make a really big thing, um, and you don't have to you know not unlike injection molding where you're making a solid part with ribs or something. Here we're making a hollow volume, but you do need to have at least one opening. Um, as a place to blow in the air. Awesome. Very cool. Awesome. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Does this, uh, another question from Ishan045, um, does this game make it disadvantageous to be an international team at Worlds? Wow, that's a very loaded question. All right. <laughs> uh, that, wow. All righty then. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know yep. what would I... make that more or less. Uh Fair I think yeah, everyone's yeah. going to have a good time at Worlds. Absolutely. That sounds like a great idea. Um, uh, Danny, one question that I found interesting is, how are the foundations made? Um, so those are made through a process. Some people call it vacuum forming. Some people call it thermoforming. Um, but there you have a – and Tyler, I sent you some pictures of this. Um, you have a, a hot sheet of uh, plastic, and then it gets uh, up to sort of the glass transition temperature. It gets draped over a form, and then uh, you pull a, a high vacuum on it really fast. So this was actually a, a prototype thermoform machine that I made at Andy Mark to test these things. Oh, wow. um, and so this is the vacuum table, and you can kind of see all the million little holes in there. Um, and then this was a form that was made to sort of roughly simulate the top half of the uh, foundation platforms. And so um, we've got some other. So that's the uh, the black sheet of plastic there that's been formed. You can see there's a metal frame around it to hold the edges. Um, and then the third part of you know this system is uh, what we sort of lovingly refer to as the flame box. Um, we needed a ton of heat to get that sheet of plastic. Uh, kind of not melty, but but enough so that it would move and wiggle. Um, so we have a uh, Mr. Heater there, a big propane heater um, fired in mm-hmm. on the bottom. There's an aluminum tub inside of that wooden box um, with an air gap in between. Um, and then so the the room temperature sheet of plastic sits over the top of that. We heat it up till it gets to about 300, 315 degrees. Um, then we move it over to the vac table with the form. We dra- drape it over the top, pull vacuum, and then we get a, a finished part. Now, I made this uh, as like a prototyping exercise. My prototypes are not terribly great. 
Um, but the company that we use, they are thermoforming experts. Um, and so we actually, it's the same process that was used to make the lander domes last season. Um, okay. And so we, we knew that these guys were absolutely phenomenal at what they were doing. Um, I had every confidence in the world that when we went to them, you know, they would make beautiful parts that are wonderfully consistent. So um, they're a company down in Indianapolis and they make uh, all of our thermoforming stuff for us. And it is super, super awesome. All right. Uh, Jim News 544 asks, why are there so many Vuforia targets on the field? Uh, it's like the pic the eight pictures are, uh, across the field so like teams can navigate uh, and using them, the cameras. All right. Uh, then we can go to our next question uh, from Eric8417 is, does Andy Mark have internship or co-op opportunities? Yes. We love getting, uh, you know, first kids, um, you know, most of the time it's, you know, when they're in college, first alumni, um, we post those on the first internship portal. Um, and so take, take a look at that, you know, the, the first scholarship internship portal, um, you know, so we, we get a lot of good uh, candidates coming through in that direction. Um, and then we also have a careers page on Andy Mark that we um, post everything at that way. Um, we sort of start that process in about December ish um and you know for for interns over the summer um if you're the sort of student that's on a co-op program and you have a, a fall or spring semester um where you can do a co-op we've had people do that as well um but yeah we have um a number of internship opportunities each uh, year and it is a ton of fun um to get all sorts of first alumni and people in on those uh jobs Hey guys, just want to jump awesome. in as we're running late on time. We're going to take a few more questions. We know we have a lot more. You're still entered for the giveaway, so don't worry, but we're only going to have a few more questions left in the show. And then X, a ducky on quack asks, do you think teams are going to build their towers in a certain pattern for structural integrity? They should. And I don't know what the best pattern is. There. Uh, All right. Um, so robot goth, um, he asks, will Andy Mark start carrying a wider range of gearboxes similar to what GoBuilda has done with their yellow jacket series? Um, we, we've kind of played around with that. We think that we have a really nice lineup. It, it really spans a, a really wide variety of different applications, especially with the, mm -hmm. um, with the stock never S gearboxes with the never S sport gearboxes. We go from, um, you know, a never S motor only all the way over to a 256 to one. So we're really excited about kind of all the different options that those bring. Um, so right now we don't have anything else that we're, we, we've got going on. Um, but we're, we're always excited to kind of, you know, keep experimenting with some stuff. All right. C McBride, uh, one six, six asked, how effective do you think low resource rookie teams will be? Uh, this the game seems pretty hard for them starting out. If they drive bricks over to their partner to stack them, they're going to be super effective because they're going to be contributing. They're going to be a part of that alliance, not just somebody who's floundering around. True, true. And then uh, Cookie Hero 289 asked, was this game intentionally designed to involve driving back and forth across the field? Well, the human player stations weren't put on the same side of the field as the scoring zones mm -hmm. on accident. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a great answer, yep. All right. Uh, so, um, oh, uh, yeah. So Jack H uh, 8788 asks, was there much considerations between tasks and a loud number of motors after going through our design? My team has found that we don't need eight DC motors to complete everything. Was this a consideration in the game design? Not too, too much. Mm hmm. I mean, we know with the use of motors and encoders, there's a lot of freedom, a lot of flexibility. Robots can do a lot of different stuff. Um, so mm -hmm. that doesn't come into the game design process too terribly much, um, mm -hmm. at least from what I have uh, insight towards. Um, but we definitely know that there is things that we probably shouldn't ask robots to do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. And our final question of the night from Richard3620 is, Danny, corn on the cob or corn dogs? Inquiring minds want to know. Oh. Danny froze. Oh, oh no! We may never know. Wow, we may but... never know the answer. <laughs> okay, I, I'll perfect. answer for Danny as he uh, now currently lives in Indiana. I'm going to infer that he's all about the corn. Uh, so, but yeah, Danny seems the question was too much for Danny, so he dropped from the call. It looks like, but <laughs> oh my! But uh, actually, I right, think so... I think Danny had a, a had a dead laptop battery. So we'll uh, we'll keep moving on. Yeah, we'll never know. Says Stand Up Sesame. That's uh, 
That's just the way it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That was funny. <laughs> all right. So we're going to roll giveaway number two right now. So you guys have put in all your questions. We're going to see who gets the moolah. Yep. And uh, we uh, just rolled for that on a random number generator. And the winner uh, for that is going to be Eric8417. Uh, er- yeah, by the way, lots of Fs in chat for Danny, please. <laughs> Eric, <laughs> Eric 8417, uh, you are the winner of the uh, awesome uh, prototype thing, so make sure you uh, reach out. I think Eric's a subscriber. Yep, it does look like he is. And while uh, it is not rigged for subscribers for this, we can still uh, put lots of rigged emotes in chat since Eric is a subscriber. So Eric, make sure you reach out to me uh, with that as well. And, uh, hey, guys, we'll uh, we'll wrap up this awesome show tonight. All right. So, Danny, we know you're not on the show right now, but we know you're going to be watching the YouTube stream. So thank you so much for taking the time on our show to talk about some of the new offerings by Andy Mark uh, and also discussing the discussing the design of, of this awesome game as a whole. Thank you guys for all the followers and subscriptions you received today. Don't forget that you can subscribe for free if you or your parents have Amazon Prime. And let's bring on our fantastic producer, Tyler, to talk or to read off who's pledged their support today. Yeah, read off a few today. Uh, I just want to say this reminder, Tier 1 subs, uh, one, once again, are 50% off. So if you don't have Amazon Prime, if you don't mind, you know, give us $2.50. I don't think that's too much to ask uh, for free content otherwise. Uh, so we appreciate that. Uh, but John Charbonneau with the Tier 1 sub, Kono King 9, uh, 865 with 9 months support. Ilan, Elan, I know I always say it wrong, sorry. 17 months of support is a go build a fan, it looks like. Uh, Alpha Biscuit, 495, a tier one sub. Dero, Lycos with the Prime sub, a Ducky on Quack, three months support. And Eric, 8417, well, you just won a, a giveaway in five months support. Uh, and anybody else who's given bits and subscribe and subs, thank you so much for keeping fun, loud, live, and independent. We can't do it without you. We need your support. Don't forget to check out our uh, Discord as well, too. And honestly, guys, the one thing uh, that you can do that makes it happen for us is just tell other people about FTC live, tell other people about fun, start spreading the word even more guys. Uh, we are about to hit 1 million uh, views on our YouTube channel and between Twitch and YouTube alone, we're going to surpass over a million views this year, just on those two platforms, not including any social media, anything like that. Fun is growing, but we have so much more opportunity to keep growing more and more. And we can't wait to have you be part of that. What an exciting time uh, to be, to have an independent organization that, you know, isn't, you know, based on the, the, the agenda or the rules have to be followed for that. We want to bring you independent content, make it stuff that you want. Please let us know what we can do better to help serve you uh, here on fun. We hope you guys enjoyed this episode of FTC Live. Um, If you want to stay connected with what we're doing, you can always follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at FunFTC and join our Discord through the link in the chat. All right. On behalf of myself, Ethan Shashir, and our producer, Tyler, working behind the scenes, I would like to thank you all for tuning in to tonight's show. See ya. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent.